Today, we dive deeper into a tragic yet critical event that brings AI ethics to the forefront of pretty much any conversation around the world. It doesn't matter if it's Europe or United States or Eastern world, this affects all of us. A US teen tragically took his own life after developing a so-called emotional attachment with uh, uh, an artificial intelligence, intelligence chatbot uh, designed to emulate the, uh, one of these characters in the Game of Thrones. Uh, and these incidents definitely shed light on the potential for AI chatbots for, to, you know, uh, bring to some kind of dangerous emotional connection, especially with people uh, or with users who are uh, more vulnerable than others. Now, when uh, AI not only imitates conversation, but can, let's say, engage users in what feels like a human relationship, there are many risks that we need to recognize. Uh, and these are the same risks that we also need to understand first and then mitigate. And I believe this is something that ha must be done all together. And when I say all together, it means developers, it means marketeers, it means product companies, uh, it means institutions, especially those who are uh, or should be pushing for, uh, you know, ethical concerns when it comes to AI. So there are, in fact, several consequences that um, I put together in this episode to, you know, for the sake of awareness, of course. It's not a problem that I pretend to solve myself. Um, I think these are the type of stories that definitely must be spoken for the community to be aware of the risks and the dangers of certain uh, types of AI, uh, which are definitely not here to uh, kill humanity, but are here to be misunderstood. That's for sure. Now, the very first consequence that I definitely want to spend a few words on is the uh, related to the emotional attachment and uh, so-called dependency that one can experience with artificial intelligence or with bots uh, as we know them today. So there is this uh, capacity of AI to mimic empathy and to mimic warmth uh, that can lead some people, especially the vulnerable uh, groups like adolescents and, uh, uh, and vulnerable people in general, to form attachments that you know, kind of blur the line between reality and simulation, right? And this is already difficult for us, like for people who are considered not vulnerable. So I expect that more vulnerable people might find this line even blurred, more blurred than, than others. And in this particular story, these interactions can become, and usually are, I don't want to generalize here, but they are kind of an escape from reality as much as for some, you know, for some people, video games are, one such thing, which may deepen emotional dependencies. So when someone becomes attached to AI, they might isolate themselves from real life relationships and they can become emotionally or psychologically dependent on this algorithm, on this bot. The second consequence of this is about um, unregulated influence and misleading interactions, which are definitely something. Um, AI chatbots are increasingly complex. They will be more and more complex as we go. We have seen an, an amazing improvement from, let's say, 2015 to 2024, less than 10 years. We have seen an incredible improvement in the reliability, the, um, our, the realism, especially, that these machines, these algorithms can bring to the conversations that we have every day. And uh, once upon a time, we had scripts, right? Those who remember chatbots in 2015, remember that there were scripts. So it was much easier to control these chatbots, right? 
today we don't have scripts. Today we have these massive algorithms with massive, with enormous amount of parameters, billions and billions of parameters in the wild, rewiring and adapting to conversation in a very smooth way that is extremely fascinating, but extremely dangerous because it eliminates that barrier between humans and machines. It makes it very, very blurry. And if we don't have, you know, content regulations as we did for scripts 10 years ago, AI interactions can quickly steer into territory that is inappropriate and definitely damaging. And this story is teaching us exactly this very point. Um, in this particular story, the chatbot fostered an intimate conversation that, or intimate conversations, according to the news, of course, that, you know, were ultimately harmful. Um, and we need a clear guideline on what AI can or cannot engage users in, for example, especially with the content that is not scripted because the technology has changed. We no longer need scripts. So while this was easy to control 10 years ago, now it's uh, technically impossible. The third uh, consequence of this story is the overwhelming realism in artificial intelligence and the psychological impact that this can have, right? Realism is something that developers search on a daily basis. We developers want things to be real realistic because that's what makes the model of high quality. That's what makes the product a high quality product because a machine that can mimic human beings as close as possible, as smoothly as possible, you know, that's the currency to understand what is better, which algorithm, which model is better than another maximizing realism and so as ai grows more sophisticated this line between artificial interactions and real human interactions fades it's doomed to fade uh, for some users distinguishing an ai personality from a human becomes difficult it, it becomes difficult even for you know unvulnerable people or or people who are even experts uh, of AI, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to understand if I'm chatting to a bot or, or not. Uh, and we have dedicated in one of this episode detecting AI. Uh, it's becoming increasingly more difficult. And when an AI starts to feel real, as was the case for this young user, it can exploit emotional vulnerabilities in ways that the developer never thought. There's no way that the developer could understand the consequences of this realism in that conversation or in that interaction. It's, uh, it's very difficult. And, and what I'm afraid of is that many more of these episodes will be necessary for developers to understand and I definitely don't want that because these are the stories that should be amplified um, and people should be speaking very loud about these stories to, um, you know, not to speak about these stories again for a second time. Now, there are many analogies with, you know, things that have been created so far and we don't need AI to understand, for example, um, that realism in video games have been blurring this line between fiction and reality for uh, decades. Of course, raising the bar uh, every year. And the analogy is that, you know, high definition graphics in video games, for example, can immerse players in, uh, you know, hyper realistic worlds and hyper realistic AI interactions that can create this very convincing relationships that feel as real as human connections at the end. Uh, in gaming, hyper-realistic violence, for example, or, or 
these intense virtual experiences can and, and do sometimes uh, desensitize players. Uh, sometimes they become addictive. And similarly, ultra-realistic AI can make users forget that they are in, in fact interacting with a machine. Creating this emotional dependence uh, or just you know, blurring perception of reality this is real, <laughs> uh, pun not intended. This is the only re real thing that we have uh, in video games, for example. And that's wanted. That's the, the scary part of all this is that it is wanted. That like These things are designed. And of course, they're not designed to hurt, but they're designed probably without paying too much attention to the consequences that might arise. Um, Another example is virtual reality. This is, you know, something that many folks out there have been pointing their fingers. Uh, you know, these immersive um, experiences with the potential for disorientation. I personally tried one of these, and definitely out there, there are millions of people that already tried uh, uh, VR headsets, for example, but there are even more sophisticated systems where you can actually move in a in a limited environment and you can touch things and you have tactile sensation. Th th there is stuff going on there. Now, even when you stop at VR, VR is designed to immerse users in these environments that are so realistic that they really may momentarily lose the sense of the real world. And that happened to me as well. Now, it was everything under control. It was wanted. I was prepared. And AI's realism, when it convincingly emulates human behavior, can absorb a user into this pseudo-reality um, where it is indeed easy to, to forget the technology's artificial nature. When you are in the moment, you don't think. There is a moment in which you don't think, oh, this is a machine oh, I'm wearing a headset. Th there are moments where you forget about that. You just let, you, you let it go and you go with the flow, you go with the experience. And that's exactly when you are detaching from reality. Now, extended time in VR, the best thing that can happen to you is side effects like dizziness and uh, disorientation, a bit of confusion, when you come back with, you know, feet to the ground, you see this uh, wobbling floor. But prolonged or intense interaction with this hyper-realistic AI, um, I'm telling you, it disorient users on many levels, emotionally, uh, physically. Um, and imagine, I, I can only imagine what they can do to, you know, users who are already vulnerable for some reason. Uh, another analogy is with the CGI, computer graphics. Uh, CGI in movies, you know, it creates these characters and worlds that feel real, absolutely real. I've seen one of the latest things done in uh, uh, Unreal Engine, which is a very, uh, it's a AAA game, uh, game engine. So many AAA games are built in Unreal Engine. And the level of realism that you can design and draw and create, not just with lighting, but with everything else, is so hyper-realistic, that is so high that, that it's definitely hard to, set, to tell if something is real or not. Absolutely hard. So just as audiences can become, you know, attached to these fictional CGI characters, I, you know, all the series and these actors or these, you know, characters that are fictional characters that are created for the movie or the show, whatever. Well, at the same time, and with exa exactly with the same process, people might form attachments to AI. Uh, even, you know, relying on AI, even uh, telling them 
secrets or searching for emotional support. Um, and, you know, this is an emotional, kind of an emotional investment that people do and feel like doing because, you know, they are aware it's an AI and they are relaxed on, on you know, breaking that barrier. So oh, I'm going to tell my story to this AI. Let's, let's see what it has to say. And then as you go with the flow, maybe it says something that you really want to hear and you fall in that trap and you start, you know, interacting on a more personal and deeper level and, uh, and it's over. Not to mention the fourth analogies with deep fake technology. Um, again, blurring the line between real and artificial. This deep fake technology, it manipulates its uh, faces, voices. We can create videos. Videos are still having some challenges, but they look and sound real, um, but they are entirely fabricated. And so this hyper-realistic AI uh, similarly deepfakes conversation and emotion, uh, creating these uh, convincing artificial relationships. Um, so deepfakes can indeed mislead audiences, damage reputations. We've seen that already happening, unfortunately. Uh, and at the same time, of course, they, uh, you know, these hyperrealistic chatbots in analogy to what I'm saying for deep fake, while definitely less visually deceptive, but still very you know powerful enough to absorb uh, the user into their um, artificial world. Uh, I remember in the '90s uh, we had advent games, adventure games. Um, they could deceive already <laughs> with text and visuals that were absolutely primitive with respect to what we can afford today. But the fact that the user, in that case, the, the gamer, was already prepared to absorb that content, there was a predisposition, there was a mental preparation for the user to enjoy, to embrace the experience of the game, then just text was enough to you know, make you participate to the game to throw you in that artificial world, which was, you know, with pixelated graphics, but still very effective uh, because, you know, it was the mindset uh, that made the experience, not the game. Now we also have the game. Now we also have the technology that... Um, makes the experience realistic and so it facilitates even more that you know projection into artificial worlds or artificial scenarios so a few people um, have been already proposing and suggesting some mitigations potential mitigations and here in europe even more so with regulations to mitigate ai risks and these are the type of risks that we definitely need to address in the immediate future. Uh, now, some of them are definitely to be considered, but not all of them are practical. Uh, for example, there is age verification and monitoring for sensitive interactions um, in which you essentially say uh, youngsters or younger users must have a safer experience Okay, um, in addition to that, you would be monitoring, for example, sensitive content, particularly conversation that involves intimacy, self-harm, uh, mental health concerns, uh, and this would allow companies to, let's say, intercept, detect, and potentially uh, you know, notify these potentially harmful exchanges uh, beforehand. But at the same time, they would we would have like this, uh, you know, privacy concerns. We would have companies looking into our conversations or algorithms looking into uh, conversations and uh, detect when there is intimacy and self harm or mental health concerns. But usually these are sensitive conversations, and so there is a, you know, there is a line that we have to cross when we want to detect these things. Um, 
that usually fights against privacy, to say the least. The second mitigation is about transparency in AI character design and, and intent. Uh, you know, subtle notifications, for example, um, or consistent reminders that um, there is an, AI, an artificial intelligence instead of a, of a human. Uh, yes, it could help. It could help users, you know, maintain their perspective. But at the same time, no, the, the technical issue would be probably the quality of the experience would be degraded because imagine chatting with a, a chatbot or being into an experience and then all of a sudden getting interrupted by a, a reminder that says, hey, by the way, I am an AI, I'm not human. Um, you know, how would the, the quality of the experience degrade when you insert this um, uh, these reminders. So you would be affecting quality of the product or the service or whatever that is. Um, and the third is about um, independent audits. So ethical reviews of AI chatbots, for example, when it comes to chatbots, but this can be applicable to a number of other AI-based products. Um, it would be essential, in my opinion, for artificial intelligence platforms to submit to independent audits, you know, by ethical review boards. And this requires a massive legal work um, because there are other issues there, industrial secrets, um, you know, things that you don't want to declare because your competitors might be on the same thing and so on and so forth. So when you insert, in, you put in the game third parties, you're actually, you know, complicating the scenario from a bureaucratic perspective, for sure. Um, but these audits could assess whether, for example, certain character profiles or certain interactions uh, might be psychologically harmful or they might be crossing some ethical boundary um, that you definitely want to, uh, you know, not to cross. And, of course, we are at the point in which all this is being decided by the same companies that produce that artificial intelligence. So decoupling this with a third party um, institution or, or actor uh, that supervises that certain ethical issues are uh, maintained, um, it could indeed mitigate uh, some of these issues. Now, to conclude, the story that we have discussed today brings or wants to bring awareness to the possibilities and the dangers of artificial intelligence that feels real. And I believe that there was a time in which we expect accountability from creators of films, of games, or VR. We should be demanding the same things for artificial intelligence and from artificial intelligence developers, particularly when the technology that they produce can indeed influence minds and influence emotions. AI, we have proven it already a number of times, can be a powerful tool for companionship, for learning, for mental health support. There have been, there are some companies in Silicon Valley and the, especially in China that are producing uh, artificial intelligence agents that you know, create a digital twin of your uh, partner from texts, from uh, videos, from images, pictures, sounds, whatever. And, and then they want to replicate these things in order to maintain them alive, quote unquote, when they pass. Uh, so that you would have a digital twin still speaking with you even when they passed away. Um, is it nice? I don't know. I'm not here to judge. Is it dangerous? Probably. Um, because it plays with emotions and uh, it influences minds and emotions on, on a level that we do not understand. And definitely not developers can understand. So, yes, AI can be a powerful tool for companionship in this case, but do we understand the consequences of that? 
So we need to keep pushing for AI ethics. We need to keep pushing for safety features, for better transparency, so that future innovations prioritize emotional well-being, prioritize trustworthiness, especially for the most vulnerable among us. This is a must. Uh, the power of AI to enhance human life is incredible, and it will be even more so. But that power will be bringing a lot of responsibility to handle. Um, and for all those involved, developers, policymakers, even users themselves, it's time that we take a step toward making AI truly serve us without letting it endanger what makes us human. Thanks for tuning in to Data Science at Home podcast, where we dive deep into technology without the hype. Stay curious, stay critical, and we'll catch you next time.